Merritt Street Media is calling that stuff out. We're calling them on it, and we're going to put it out in front of people so they have the information they need to make the decisions in an informed way. I've never seen a new set with the power of what we have here. And it's not just about the physical plan, it's about the ability to tell the story, to, mm. to deliver the truth with understanding and power. I've, I've never seen anything like we've created here. This is absolutely amazing. I, I think it's gonna spread like wildfire. I think we've got an army out there that is ready to get behind what we're doing. Where I am in my professional life and my television life is all about us. Okay. It really is all about us. And I think there's a great story to their being in us. As you alluded to, I've spent a lot of years on television, about half of what you've spent on television. You, you, your family's been doing this for 50 years, right. mine for about half of that. So we've been on parallel tracks here, uh, but they started merging at one point mm -hmm. to, to create an us. And look, I, I spent 21 years um, on CBS and um, really am proud of the body of work that I created there. Um, but, you know, winds shift. Mm -hmm. And I, I really began to feel uh, constrained in, in many respects. And as things were changing in the world, um, I, I felt like I needed wider guardrails. Mm -hmm. I felt like I needed more freedom to talk about some of the social issues and some of the things that I thought absolutely threatened this country as I know it and, and love it. Mm. And I needed the ability and the freedom and the platform mm. to be able to talk about those things uh, in an unfettered way. I needed a bigger platform with wider guardrails without any constraints to be able to talk about the things I needed to talk about because one of the things I needed to talk about was the fact that people can't talk about the things that need to be addressed right now in this society. And I was living in that. Mm -hmm. uh, now I was in California. And California is very liberal. California is very woke. California is very much about, you know, let's, let's run an agenda that doesn't really have, in my opinion, connection to reality. Wow. It, it's a bubble. Right. Wow. It's a bubble in many respects. And a lot of the people out there have an agenda uh, that ignores science, that ignores history, uh, that ignores the reality of what made this country what it is today. And I have wonderful relationships in California, wonderful associations in California, but there's a zeitgeist there that just doesn't mm -hmm. jive with my heart and my reality. I, I said I, I needed a bigger platform, a broader platform, a bigger megaphone. And at that point, a, a common friend, Bill McIntyre, brought you and I together. We started talking and uh, found that our values were very much aligned. And in fact, our vision was aligned. And I came to find that the vision that I had was one that you had had for 30 years. Yes. And I sat with the two of you in your home in Colorado. We met several times before that, but I thought that was a really pivotal meeting when you opened your home to me in, in Colorado. And I came there and we really talked about turning thought into action yeah. and ideas into reality. Yeah. And, um, and you fed me very well. And <laughs> Well, when Dr. Phil calls up and goes, where are you guys? <laughs> well, we're in Colorado. Okay, I'll be there Wednesday morning. <laughs> what? What? Yeah, okay. Lori went. We'll be at what? the airport. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so we, we sat down and I, I, I thought we really had some very candid conversations then that um, I don't think we were leading that conversation. Mm -hmm. I think we were participating in a conversation that we were led to have and yeah. were led in the conversation. Yeah that had started 30 years before that day.
Okay, Dr. Phil, uh, 30 years ago, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was a pivotal time in Lori and my life. We uh, were happy employees at TBN. And in 1992, we resigned our position and moved to Hollywood. Okay, look, that takes a long time to unpack. Uh, but we did that because we felt the Lord was leading us to do that. We spent 20 years uh, not far from the Paramount Studios. We lived uh, in the Hollywood Hills, and we had a vision to get outside the four walls of the church and largely outside the four walls of even Christian television. And that was really put into us interestingly, by a progression of even what my own family experienced. My mom and dad were told that if they went to a movie theater and watched Roy Rogers and Dale Evans ride around on their horse and shoot bad guys, <laughs> and if the Lord came back, the Lord would just drop you straight into hell right from that movie theater. My mom and dad came to the conclusion that technology and movies were neutral. The intent of the producer uh, tainted it for good or evil. And then I grew up where my dad was then supporting my vision of making movies in Hollywood. So we watched this progression, this huge pendulum swing of, you know, my grandparents uh, saying that all technology was evil, period. Okay. Radio was a force to take the goodness and the righteousness away from somebody. And so there was a be ye separate, come out from amongst the world and be ye separate scripture that was taken totally out of context, in my opinion, and applied to the way Christians were living their lives. My mom and dad largely broke out of that. They supported Lori and I living in... <gasps> Hollywood, California, you know, clutch your pearls, you know, and, and, and we lived and raised our boys in Hollywood, California. And we were trying to create content for people that weren't quite ready for, you know, Christian television, weren't quite ready to darken the door of a church. And that lived in us very strong. One day, my mom and dad called and met with us and said, TBN is a little too big for us to run at our age. Please, can you come help? We did. We sold our, our film production company, moved back down to Orange County. And both mom and dad are gone now. The second generation of TBN is fully realized. And we sit today uh, with a very interesting, let's say, dilemma on our hands. We look back 30 years ago and even prophetically, a dear friend, minister friend of ours, Kim Clement, gave a word of the Lord in a very beautiful church service in front of a whole bunch of people that we, Lori and I, would have entrance into the hearts of the ungodly without them even knowing it. What does that mean? That means content that is about truth, principle, principled uh, uh, content. There's the person of Jesus and there are the principles of Jesus. And we feel like everyone gets that in 2024. They're going, oh my Lord, it's about time that God orchestrated the lives of Dr. Phil McGraw, Robin McGraw, Matthew and Lori to come together, widen the scope of what it means to be talking about principles uh, godly principles in content, and we found each other in a way that caused a brand new company, Merritt Street Media, to be formed. It is 24 hours a day. So I think the easiest way to say this is if you needed wider guardrails, if you needed a bigger vision, and you did, you were limited to one hour a day uh, in daytime television. Now you're helping program 24 hours a day on a brand new channel that you named Merit Street Media. Merit is meritocracy is a big word in, the, in your world. And you explained all that to us. And 
it's largely embedded in us now. And we found each other in a way at the right time. And I know our audience is saying, finally, somebody is going to get after it and start making content for people that aren't quite ready for TBN, not quite ready for church, that need something that is embedded and grounded in truth. And you're that guy. And thank you for uh, what you're doing to help us cause Merritt Street Media to come into existence. Well, I hope that's true. The intention behind what we're doing together um, is, is so important. I believe that a lot of this narrative, a lot of what's happening in America right now and is being pushed by this, these fringe groups, I think are designed to break down America. I think the backbone of America is the family unit. Yes. I, I truly do. I, I think we're as strong as family in America. And I think that family unit is under attack. I think the role of the mother is under attack. The role of the father is under attack. Uh, I, I think even the distinction between mother and father is under attack. And I think the role of them as parents is being eroded. And I, I think when that happens, you start to see fragmentation in the family with, with children. I've always said to parents, you're not going to be the only voice in your child's ear, so you need to make sure you're the best voice in your child's yeah. ear, that you're telling them the vital information they need to make the right choices at the right time and the right decisions when they get in those difficult situations. And right now, we've got people telling them, oh, you know, that's, that's not important. We've got college universities that I have come out and said are doing nothing but fostering intellectual rot, mm. yeah. that they're not teaching them values. They're not teaching them to value human life. They're not teaching them to treat themselves with dignity, to hold themselves to standards. We're coddling this generation, and you've got these universities that are charging an arm and a leg for an elite education, mm. and then telling them, we should have a quality of outcome. Well, then why do you need an elite education? I mean, wow. you can't talk out of both sides of your mouth. I'm going to charge you $150,000 for this college education, but everybody should have equal outcome. Well, which is it? <laughs> which is it? You want my money. And then they get them down there and teach them not that there's such a thing as toxic masculinity, but that masculinity itself is toxic. They're not preparing them for the next level of life. Right. And when they get out of that university and get out into the competitive world and, and try to get a job and try to pay for braces for their child, try to pay rent, wh where are those professors going to be then? Gone. You're not going to be able to find them with a flashlight <laughs> and a map. You, they're gone. And, and nobody's calling them out on that. And they need to call them out on that. We've got, they shut this country down for two years and took our children out of school at a time that anxiety and depression were at the highest levels ever recorded since they started keeping records at the highest level ever recorded. And the people who keep those records are the ones that shut the schools down and sent those kids home knowing that that experience in the schools is vital to their very well-being. And you know something else that happened during that time? It's during that time that we saw referrals for child molestation and wow. abuse drop 50%. It's not because the abuse dropped 50%. It's because the mandated reporters the teachers, the coaches, the cafeteria workers and bus drivers who noticed the signs didn't get to see those kids. Why? Because we sent them home and locked them up with their abusers. Mm -hmm. And the people who did that are the same people who knew those children were not at risk from that disease. And what they say today is, 
we did the best we could with what we knew. No, you did not. Wow. No, you did not do the best you could with what you had. You got power and you abused it and nobody is calling them on it. Yeah. And they're continuing to do that in this category and this category and this category. And Merritt Street Media is calling that stuff out. We're calling them on it and we're going to put it out in front of people so they have the information they need to make the decisions in an informed way. Come there on, we go. Come, Come on. on. <laughs> and the guardrails just right. widened again. Yeah. Um, Dr. Phil, I this is it. this is a day that mm -hmm. Lori and I have dreamed of. Yeah. This is a day we've dreamed of. The idea that truth leads, okay? And the 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 days of a headline, if it bleeds, it leads. If it's truth, it's gonna lead. Merritt Street Media and the truth is what we're after. And we want debate. We want understanding. And we, we're tired of a, of a world where we get on this side of the street and the other side of the street and we yell our positions across the street at each other like that's going to mm -hmm. help or that's going to do anything. And until we open up the debate lane again and bring people together, and you're going to do that on Dr. Phil Primetime. We're so proud of you. Yeah. And you know how I'm going to do it? I'm going to do it by talking to the people that are affected by the issues. Right. People have seen me for 21 years with real people facing real problems, looking for real solutions, sitting in front of me, looking for help. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. I'm not going to do a political show. Right. I I'm not interested in that. I'm going to do a show that is dealing with real people facing real problems, looking for real answers. And I'm willing to debate anybody on anything that we talk about for two reasons. I do my homework and I believe in what I'm talking about. And I'm real good at it <laughs> because I'm looking to solve problems, not win arguments. I love that. You can win the argument, I don't care. Declare yourself right. We'll declare you the winner before you even get there but let's leave with a solution. Yeah. Let's all go home being part of the solution, not part of the problem. And to do that, we gotta find a way to work together. Yeah. We have a dear friend, a pastor named Erwin McManus. This guy's a deep thinker. And I was standing in his service one time, uh, kind of in the back, I was assessing the, the church for some television specials that we were gonna be shooting in there. So I was standing in the back and he said one of the most profound things. He said, I do a lot of my church service that you're attending, not for you, not for you that are sitting in these seats in front of me, but for the person that walked by my church on the sidewalk and never darkened the door. That's who I do this service for. And we feel like there is a time upon us now here in 2024 where People are losing their collective minds and they have literally walked away from common sense. And you've got to get right in the middle of that for us. I think you're describing it much better than I have. People have collectively chosen to stand down. As you say, they, they've walked away from common sense or at least chosen not to assert it. And I have a statistic that I talk about in We've Got Issues that says the number, the percentage of people that are afraid to express their views today has tripled mm. in the last 75 years. Since 1950, it's tripled. So people today are afraid of getting labeled canceled, called phobic, hatred, hater, because, and so they don't want to say anything. It's like, nah, I'm better off just keep my mouth shut. And in, in this new book that I've done, I, I put a poll together and conducted a national poll for the book before I ever wrote it and asked people, how often do you worry that you're going to say the wrong word. Mm. You're going to use the wrong term. And something like 80% answered that often or very often 
they think, oh, you know, I'm better off just not saying anything because yeah. I don't know the word of the week because the, the glossary changes right. very often, right? I mean, it, yeah. it changes. You, you, don't, you never know what's the, what's the current terminology. <laughs> and people are afraid if I say something wrong, then I'm going to be labeled a hater and, mm-hmm. and put on the bad list. So people have just defaulted to those that are the loudest. And we have to make a decision. Are we going to pay the most attention to the loudest voice or are we going to think for ourselves? And so one of the things that I want to do is give people vital information so they know, oh, no, I know the answers to this. We've got something right now called presentism going on, which is a, a phenomenon where people take today's mores, folkways, or laws, and apply them to what people did sometimes 200 years ago. That's why they're tearing down statues of Thomas Jefferson. Now, he owned slaves. Is slave ownership a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing. Don't need to think about it. Bad thing. At the time, it was a normative thing. He's held to a standard that he was supposed to know that 250 years later, that would be decided that that was a bad thing, even though at the time it was the norm. So tear his statue down. Did did he do any good things? Well, he did write the Declaration of Independence. He, he, He did do that, among a few other things, but tear that down and take him out of the history books. Um, you, you, some people want to deny that that ever happened. It did happen. We, you can't erase history. How are we going to learn from our mistakes if we don't acknowledge that we made them? Mm. Right. Are, are these people insane? Mm. We have to talk about these things. And I, I can't sit by and, and let truth be buried. We are sitting with Dr. Phil McGraw today in the beautiful Dallas Metroplex, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And this is a brand new studio facility that is in part housing a brand new initiative called Merritt Street Media. And it will be launching here in 2024. And you've mentioned, I'm glad you did, uh, We've Got Issues, your brand new book, How You Can Stand Strong for America's Soul and Sanity. This will be your 11th book. You have 10 number one New York Times bestsellers in your rearview mirror. And we believe that this is the one that tells more about who you are, in essence, uh, because this is, if you needed a wider guardrail situation, you've written this book to tell us what those guardrails are. Lori and I read the book. Love it. We feel like it gave voice to a lot of the things that were on the inside of us. We endorse every word of it. It's beautifully and powerfully written. An entire chapter on your faith, uh, the importance of faith in society. And what I want to say about it is I know that the audience, that something is jumping inside of people, that they're saying, finally. And if it took a common friend of ours, Phil McIntyre, who Lori's always said is a young little prophet. He doesn't claim that. He's a music guy. <laughs> he is. <laughs> but he's a prophet in our minds. And, and what I remember about our origin story um, is this. Um, I, was, I was actually out of the country. I'm not sure exactly where I was, but I was, I was out of the country. And we got on a Zoom call. And... The, the, the positioning that you're in right now where you kind of lean forward like this, you, you, uh, you got your, your head very close to the, to the, to the screen and you, you <laughs> put your head really close. It was just really close. And I, that's what I remember. It's just this part of you was really close to the camera. And you said something to me that was really profound. Um, what I remember, the version I remember is you said something to the effect of, Matt, I'm, I'm, I'm too rich and too old to care anymore 
about what people are going to say about what I have to get into in the truth. Is that true? Did you say that to me? Verify that. Very possible. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, all I, could, all I could sit there and think is that when my dad got into his 70s, don't say it. Yeah, I'm not going to say it. I'm, I'm going to try to say it in, in, in a kind of a give a darn pe- meter. Give a darn meter. Give a darn yeah, broke. His give a darn <laughs> meter broke. Okay. And there was a couple of times on live television where his give a darn meter was fully broken and he told us exactly what he thought about something. And I, I lived the last number of years with my father where where it was almost like, Dr. Phil, you picked up that mantle, that torch, that burning torch mm-hmm. to get into something. And, it, and it's going to take someone who does not care anymore. The most dangerous army in the whole world is one that doesn't care whether it lives or dies. And we're here and announcing a very large initiative called Merit Street Media, 24-hour channel. It'll be ubiquitous. It'll be everywhere. And Dr. Phil, it is your wide berth to get into it. We have all sorts of programming uh, lined up with tons of people. Don't want to have to start naming names now. But you and I, I believe, are, we're being led by the Lord, crashed into each other. And today we sit announcing a huge initiative, Merit Street Media 24-hour channel. I love this because I think that (laughs) so many people that are watching even right now have a stirring down on the inside of you. (laughs) And I'm telling you, so at the beginning of of last year, about this time, Dr. Phil called and did say, where are you? We're in Colorado. I'll be there tomorrow morning. And sure enough, he was there. And I think I've met more people this year that have said God has impressed mm. on me to do something that doesn't make sense. Wow. It's, it's not in my capacity that I have thought that I could actually accomplish. Mm. I can't do it by myself. Mm. And God has put on people, I believe, a spirit of boldness and, and a purpose that you can't contain and you know you need God to finish to help you, to, to help you do what God has called you to do. And I think that is something that we've been living this year. And when Dr. Phil came in and everything was great and wonderful and we talked and it was like, oh my goodness, it was something that we have felt for 30, 30 about Plus 33 years, years ago. Um, just this getting outside, doing stories, telling stories like Jesus told stories. That's how he nudged people towards receptive insight of the kingdom of God is to throw the principles of the gospel. The, the, the things that sustain us daily, sustain us, is God's principles at work in the Bible. It's all laid out for us in the Bible. All the truth that we need, all the purpose, all of the, the seeds of, of planting and reaping and, and the goodness of God, it's all there for us in, in the Bible. And so we had this stirring to tell stories and to sow truth, to sow those seeds of, of goodness and kindness and love and, and, and hope and peace and joy and, and to throw out hope to people. And so all these years we've talked about it, all these years we've thought, you know, we're not, we don't just have to cram Jesus down people's throat. Jesus didn't do that himself. He told stories and he, and, and nudged people towards the kingdom of God. And, and I remember, I remember a few days after he left, sorry. Um, this was, and, and you don't have to tell Matt twice on some things. When he feels something, he's he just go, he's just on go. And I remember Matt saying, uh, calling someone on our team and saying, I need you to be in Hollywood. This is what we're doing. And it was a huge step out of our boat. It was, 
it was a commitment that we have never made. My in-laws didn't make this commitment. It was a big commitment for us. It was a big step. And and I remember this person, I won't won't say his name. You won't throw him under the bus. He scared the tar out of me because he was talking reality. He was telling us, can't do this. You, you know, we're, we're going to run out. We're, we're, we can't do this. And I, it, it got to my stomach, to the pit of my stomach, and I could have just run and thrown up. And Matt goes, that's what's going to happen. And, uh, and I'll talk to you later, but you're going to do this. And I just started praying, Dr. Phil, and I, and I'm talking out loud and I was packing up our things because we were leaving with the Pompeos when they left. And I just, all I knew to pray is I was like wanting God to speak to us, like, like open the heavens. (laughs) I need a microphone. Show us a big Dr. Phil (laughs) face is what she was asking for. You know, and I was, because fear had gripped me. And I said, either I'm going to walk in fear or I'm going to walk in faith. And I started just repeating some of the things that we have felt that God has spoken to us over the, over the years of having entrance of, in the hearts of the ungodly, to taking his name into places where it's dim and unheard and make it famous, and to do our part to see the kingdom of God come to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Hmm. And all of a sudden, I just started repeating all the things that God has already told us, all the things that he's already already proven and and god you you've gotten us this far and and all of a sudden it's like i took on where is your faith where is your faith so i and 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 i felt bad for jesus <laughs> this is honest to god i was like god, he must have been so disappointed in his disciples i have walked with you I have shown you miracle after miracle. I have told you that this was going to happen. And I have busted my rear end all day, feeding thousands of people in front of your eyes by multiplying what you have in your hand. And then, you know, he falls asleep trying to just catch, catch a little sleep on the boat. And then they're yelling at him, you know, don't you care that we're dying here? So, so imagine me feeling like that. God, don't you look at your, look, look what's that, what's happening? You know, aren't you going to speak one more time? And it was like, where, where is your faith? And I felt, I felt the disappointment, the disappointment of man. I have mm-hmm. shown my my miracles for your family for fifty years in what God has done through Trinity Broadcasting Network. I have every day provided for you and Matt. I have. Where is your faith? You know, and and so then it was like. Then the I'm I'll do a new thing, and I think we all think about that scripture at the beginning of the year. I'm I will do a new thing. Can't you see it? Can't you perceive it? The and I said, God, I, you told us that the best in their field would come, and I've always thought of staff because I love the people that work with us. I love the people that have come with you. I believe that God has called the best in their field to come. I just believe that with all my heart, and so so I started saying. God, you told us that the best in their field would come, that you'll bring them. And it's like, I just walked him through your front door. What are you going to do with that? Mm. And Dr. Phil, a couple hours go on. I'm bawling. I'm weeping. I'm, I'm, I'm being chastised, I feel. I, I'm, I'm being challenged by God going, I told you. I was going to do this 30 30 years ago. Can you not perceive it? I just walked him through your front door. What more do I need to do? Mm -hmm. And when he got home, I said, you've got to sit down. And and I'm just shaking inside. And I said, you have to sit down. I have to tell you something. I have been back there praying. And I have been crying out to God, God, you have got to confirm your word. And I said, right now, Matthew, I said, I am, my fear has completely flipped. 
And I said, at first, I was afraid to make the commitment and to actually, this is a whole new world for us. And I said, I said, we can stay and do Christian television till Jesus comes and everything's good. Not get out of the box, stay in our box, stay, stay what's been working for 50 years, what, you know, <laughs> or you can get out of the box and what, look what God can do outside of our little boxes. And I turned to Matt and I said, I have so much fear of the Lord right now. My fear has flipped from fear of man and things going bad to the fear of God saying, would God ever speak to us again if we didn't do it? And I'm telling you that flipped on me. And I want to tell you that are watching today, I would do more knowing that God is with me <laughs> than trying to be comfortable in the things of the past. It says, don't even consider the past anymore. God is doing a new thing. And I believe that this is happening right now for such a time as this, because God wants to bring his kingdom to the earth. And it's through truth. And it's from knowing truth. And it's from people being set free out of their bondages. Dr. Phil, you've done that every day for years. You have set people free in their minds and in their hearts to be better, to do something greater, to be more, to know the truth and the truth that sets you free. Your book, your book talks about how to get out of this fringe mentality of the people screaming. It's almost like the evil in the world on both sides and coming together and reasoning together and being set free on the inside out and letting God do something new on the inside of you. And I believe that that God is right in the middle of this. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't be more happy, even though it keeps us on our heels, it keeps us on our toes, and it keeps us needing God every single day. And you could not be in the most beautiful position of your life than needing God at his maximum every day in your life. And he'll meet you there. God will meet you where your faith is and you can do it. You can step out and you can believe God for anything that he's called you to do. And it's just, he will do it through you and there's nothing to fear because he's with you. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And when I launched Dr. Phil in 2002, I was really excited. Um, you know, I, I had been running courtroom sciences here in Dallas. Um, trial science firm, mm -hmm. you know, in, involved in major litigation uh, around the world, not just the United States, but clients from all over the world. And I, I really loved it, uh, but I'd done everything to do. I, I mean, I'd been involved in everything you could be involved in. And then decided uh, with the help of, of Oprah, which cannot be overstated. Uh, the O factor is huge. Um, launched the Dr. Phil show and could not have been more excited. And I didn't have to do that. I could have stayed what I was doing or retired and played golf, but I did it. And I didn't know how long it was going to last. Two years, three years, four years. Um, and 21 years later, I was still doing it and certainly could have justified retiring then, you know, with another 21 year career. I felt absolutely driven, called just on a mission to do this. And I am more excited about this now than I was that then. I'm passionate about this. I feel, and, you know, I, I've never been afflicted with the need to be loved by strangers. <laughs> that's, that's not anything that I've ever, you know. You, that's my problem. Of course, you, you want everybody to think you're wonderful, of course, but I, I, it's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, but it's always the right time to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And 
as long as I believe in what I'm doing, that's all that matters yeah. to me. If I believe it, and and I do my homework, so I don't just yeah. decide, well, I think this is right. If I think it's right, then I research it, I study it, I, I, I do everything I can to make sure that it's a responsible thing to do. And I've done that. We, we're going to have, I've been on every network's news department. That I, I can't, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, I mean, uh, dozens of times. I've never seen a, a new set with the power of what we have here. And it's not just about the physical plan. It's about the ability to tell the story, to, mm. to deliver the truth with understanding and power. I've, I've never seen anything like we've created here. This is absolutely amazing. And we've got Joel Cheatwood, who is... Uh, absolute legend in the news business and uh, who's who's leading the news charge here. And what I love about Merritt Street Media is every show is connected to every other show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The news is connected to Dr. Phil Primetime and Dr. Phil Primetime is connected to the news and it and and that's connected to uh, Nancy Grace and all of the things that 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 we're doing are all in, interconnected, and this is a destination network. This is one that you can turn on in the morning and put the remote in a drawer. Yeah, because it's safe to leave it on all day. Your kids can watch it. You can watch it. Um, I, I want to bring families back together, give them information that they can trust. Uh, this is television you can use, and and it's everything is interconnected here. We're under one roof, and it's truly it's truly everybody working together to bring uh, a voice to America. And we're going to have citizen journalism here. People can participate in what we're doing. This is going to be something that it's it's not really television; it's participation. This is something where everybody is going to be involved. People haven't seen what we're getting ready to do. One of the things that when I think of an origin story, when, when Lori and I sit back and we think about what's happening in this physical plant, 250,000 square feet facility here in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex and all the studios that are being developed and all the people that are being hired, one of the things that the Lord said to us many years ago is the very best in their field will come to you. And Dr. Phil, you know, how do you get any better in your field than being the number one syndicated TV show in America for 21 years? You know, the very best in his field, you, literally called and walked into the door and sat on our brown couch, you know, in Colorado. And by later that day, we had a handshake and our attorneys had something signed within a few days, and and it was it was just meant to be. There's something going on, Doctor Phil, that has met in the middle here, and Merritt Street Media is where these number one people, number one influence, number one this, they're all coming here, and we didn't all all we did is got crashed into each other. We can't take all the credit for this. Because I believe God got you by the nap of the neck and Lori and I by the nap of the neck and, and Robin and just made us sit there and look at each other till we got this done. That's what's going on here. And our audience is, is going, well, goodness sakes, it's about time. Well, it is time. And I hope people, I mean, I hope they tune in to Dr. Phil Primetime and they're going to see the Dr. Phil they've always seen. They're going to see wider guardrails, but they're going to see me doing what I do. And I want them to ask themselves two questions. Is he bringing into my home the right message? Mm -hmm. And is he the right messenger? Mm -hmm. And if he is, I'm going to come back tomorrow and watch again. Mm -hmm. And they tune into the news. Is this true? Are they delivering the truth? All the rest of it's gone, but are they telling me the truth? If so, 
I'm going to tune in again tomorrow, mm -hmm. and I'm going to keep coming back, and I'm going to keep coming back, and I'm going to tell everybody I know what's happening over there because I think it's going to spread like wildfire. I think we've got an army out there that is ready to get behind what we're doing. You know, I, I sat with Nancy Grace. We sat in her home, and she told us why she gets into justice issues, why she does true crime, why she does this. She was engaged to be married. Her husband was yeah. to be, her fiance was uh, brutally murdered. The person that murdered him was never caught. Justice was never, uh, she never felt a sense of justice in regard to that. She never got, you know, any kind of answers. And she lives today telling other people's stories because she, know what it's, she knows what it feels like to not ever get justice. So she's about that. There's a, there's a kind of a preacher way to say that. Your pain will either become your prison or your platform. And Nancy has chosen justice as her platform because of the pain she experienced it. And she could have been a victim all of her life, or she could turn into who she is and getting justice. And, and, and you know, that just plays into this meritocracy, uh, you know, kind of, theme that we're putting on top of Merit Street Media. And I mean, I couldn't be more content that God is leading us in what's happening here with this new initiative. Well, I feel exactly the same way and I can't wait for it to unfold. <laughs> I'm honored to be part of the whole thing. Go big or go home, baby.